Radish Amur Sekra was born on July 2nd, 2001 in Sri Lanka and immigrated to Canada at the age of two. He attended St. Robert Catholic High School and graduated in 2019 before going to the University of Toronto, U of T that same year to pursue a degree in philosophy. He actually graduated last year with high distinction from the Institute and the respective program as well. With a strong expertise and experience in the field, he managed to obtain many scholarships and awards during his time at the institution. We'll get into more of that in the show. He has written many academic publications, conducted thorough research projects, and completed many scholarly presentations as well. He was a TA at the University of Toronto's philosophy department, and now he's currently taking a break from his studies to explore more opportunities in the field. And now my good old friend Radish joins me live. How are you doing, bro? Hey, Daniel. Nice to see you. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, just conversing about things. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem, man. Actually, fun fact uh, for people that don't know, we have known each other since elementary school, so it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, so I guess that adds up to like 10, 15 years now. So yeah, uh, well, we uh, we haven't really conversed in a really long time, but <laughs> uh give or take we 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 have known each other since elementary school since like i remember grade great i was in grade one you're in grade two i think there you go. Uh, yeah so it's been a while <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's great it's, it's yeah. really cool to be here it's really cool yeah it's great to see you so uh i can start off the interview by saying what made you interested to pursue a degree in philosophy yeah no so um there's a like personal and professional motivation um right that they happen to be separate but they also were compatible with each other um mm -hmm. On the professional end of things, I just uh, decided to pursue a degree in philosophy uh, mm -hmm. because I wanted to go to law school when I first okay. started university. And mm -hmm. generally, the advice you get when you're thinking about law school is, oh, take some philosophy courses or do a philosophy major. Right. Um, philosophers and philosophy in general is about logic and arguing. And right. generally, to be a good lawyer, you have to be really good at logic and arguing. Um, right. So that was the advice I got from a lot of people. And I just decided to give it a try. Mm -hmm. And around that same time, there was also this kind of personal interest for me because I sort of grew up um, sort of like a religious, uh, I, I have a religious background and I, I was starting to question things about, you know, just lots of things about God and what like the differences between like true right and wrong things are. Mm -hmm. and with all the love I have for, you know, like religion and its and its purpose, generally like priests don't ask the same questions as philosophers. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in the questions philosophers were asking. So kind of those two things came together at the same time. We're like, oh, no, this is great. This is definitely something I uh, I want to pursue. And then I just ended up loving it a lot more than the idea of law school. Mm -hmm, so I mm -hmm. just decided to do that. But yeah, no, that, that's the motivation. No, that, that, that that's great to hear. Like, I, I really do feel like philosophy was actually one of the courses uh, at our high school. We'll get into high school yeah. later in, the, in our interview. But philosophy is a very interesting field i think it opens up your eyes a lot and it's just very interesting um to, to take um and i think it's a little bit lighter than law school but it still applies so i think it's a good 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 pathway that you took so it's good no 100 percent. i mean like the, the sort of reputation lawyers have is that they're not like super happy with their careers exactly um, so I, I i think maybe it was a good decision for me but yeah for sure for sure so now that you 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 you've done philosophy at U of T which uh because I know you you wrote a lot of you know publications during your time as a student which one did did you like writing the most which one kind of stood out to oh, you cool yeah that's a great question um so one of the publications that still to this day stands out to me was a publication I actually co-authored uh with my sort of good friend um and colleague her name is Michelle Michelle Huang mm -hmm. um she was a like, former student at Duke University uh, and now she like works for the CBC, super brilliant. But um, we basically wrote about the sort of like applied ethics guidelines for like vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, the re that was interesting for quite a few reasons. One, it was interesting to work with Michelle because her background is in like neuroscience and public health. Okay. Um, so just like being able to work with someone who thinks in like a completely different mode than you right first of all it's it's a learning experience because michelle's like teaching me things here that i would never have figured while we're researching but it's also just fun because you're kind of bouncing ideas yeah, off for one sure another. Yeah. You, yeah no it's super super yeah. cool yeah. especially when you work with the same people all the time like you work with other people yeah. in the philosophy department it's mm -hmm. cool to branch out yeah, yeah so that was cool for that reason um it was cool too for me on a really personal level because that was around the time i started getting really interested in like 
health ethics and like bioethics and sort of the the sort of philosophy of public health and stuff mm -hmm. um that was like my earliest soiree into uh, that sort of research and that kind of ended up becoming what I've stuck with because mm -hmm. it just really interested me um and the third reason it was important is because we wrote it during the pandemic Right. So it was just like writing about like this controversial hot topic. And I won't, I, we won't get into the details of that. Right. <laughs> but like just having the opportunity to be like, oh, cool. This is happening right now. Like people are right. upset about this as yeah. we're writing it. So it was really right. cool to be able to just like, on one hand, do research, but also just like look out, see what people are saying, oh. see what the world is like. So yeah, for that reason, that one really like sticks out to me as one of the ones that I one was really interested in, but also just enjoyed writing a lot. Yeah, I, I could I could tell that it was probably enjoyable to write it because you were like indoors and you had nothing else better to do. So and everything was happening in, in that time. So I think it was a good time to to do that project. It was it was good. Yeah, it was it was I, I, in general, it's worth saying that like co-authoring a paper can either be like the best or worst experience possible uh, right. it can be the best thing because it's just more interesting than writing on your own mm -hmm. but if you and your co-authors don't really agree it can be uh it can be rocky I i've heard but i've had good experiences yeah for sure for sure so yeah. um i actually wanted to know radish so did you have a capstone project as part of your philosophy mm -hmm. degree i think you did and even if you yeah, yeah I, I wanted to know like what how how rewarding was it to finish cool. that capstone and yeah. what was the process like um okay to, to complete it yeah yeah no um so yeah in my senior year i did do like a sort of capstone like some of research project mm -hmm. um i basically so um one it was very rewarding so i'll say that out of the gate and i'll explain why mm -hmm. um in just a second so the project topic was on the sort of political philosophy of john rawls John Rawls is like a really significant sort of modern political thinker. He's kind of, I think you can make the argument he's one of the most important political thinkers in the last like 100, uh, 100 or so years. So it was one that was just cool to work on him because he's so interesting and mm -hmm. sort of influential. So that was already like a nice thing. Um, usually capstones are like supervised. Um, and the reason it was so rewarding for me is because I got to work with sort of like a philosophical hero of mine, um professor tom herka mm -hmm. um tom professor tom herka recently retired from uf philosophy department there's i can say like the general stuff about professor herka like he's just yeah. incredibly brilliant and good at what he does great but um the reason it's more significant for me at least is because there's generally like two big camps in political philosophy either mm -hmm. you think the state has this important job of making us happy and like making sure that our lives are good you can sort of call this like the perfectionist view or right. like the perfectionist view is the correct term right. on the other side you have a lot of people who say like no my happiness is my responsibility i don't want the state telling me how to live a good life mm -hmm. you the state should just provide like the bare essentials and the minimums and leave it up to me to sort mm -hmm. of you know determine what's good for me there's a lot mm -hmm. of arguments on both sides the reason mm -hmm. i'm explaining this is because John Rawls was huge on like the state being neutral. He was like pretty much the foremost thinker who argued that, okay, let private individuals choose what makes them happy. The state just do the bare minimum. Um, the reason this is significant is because on the other side of the debate, Professor Tom Herka is one of like the leading scholars in the world on perfectionism. He's right. made incredible strides to kind of show why maybe the state should play this role in making us happy. So it was really, really crazy mm -hmm. writing a paper on these on like on these topics right. while working with like these two thinkers. Uh, just explaining it to me right now, I'm just like yeah. I'm baffled. Like, how can you write about this? Like, I'm lost. Yeah, it's, it. It, 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 it was a hard <laughs> one, and like, um, I love Professor Herka, but he he's not easy on you. You know, like you you give right. him a draft, and he's gonna give you pages and pages of corrections yeah. and notes. But he's great. Um, mm -hmm. so for me, like having the opportunity to kind of you know, work with someone. So funny thing too is like when Professor Herka was in university, he like listened to a few John Rawls lectures in person. So mm -hmm. for me, it was like this passing of the torch moment. It was really mm -hmm. cool to work with him. Mm -hmm. um, it was rewarding because I was interested in the topic. Um, and as far as process goes, because I know you mentioned, you know, you were yeah. asking about the process. I can tell you a little bit about my process. I don't know if everybody writes like this. Sure. Um, 
my process is one i'm going to kind of pick just the topic i'm generally interested in right, right. so yeah. like that the topic of that paper was like what's the proper role of the state like pretty right. simple yeah um then the thing i'm going to do is i'm going to just try to read as many of the positions as i can so i'm going to see like what philosophers are saying like both classically so when i say classically like both the historical positions on it and mm -hmm. what new like people are saying right now exactly right and i'm gonna kind of try to figure out what positions speak to me right like you're mm -hmm. not gonna agree with everybody um and my process often looks like okay who's intuitively attractive like what positions stick out to me as making the most sense right um then the real fun starts because then you can start looking for like the little holes and problems and you're like hmm, okay now within this topic and the subtopic what are the little breaking points like what are the problems that still haven't really been talked about in much detail right. and how can we sort of like find the how can we stress test these ideas right because now we're doing nitty-gritty stuff so for me that process was sort of you know like okay what's the role of state here are what the big picture people are saying about it like oh okay now what positions are attractive to me okay within that position what are the problems like what are we working on like what is still on the table so that's kind of what process looks like for me for like most things i'll, I'll end up writing i see i think that goes for everyone for me yeah. like i just pick a general topic dummy mm -hmm. it down break it down into smaller steps yeah. right i think yeah. that goes for every paper you write in university yeah we don't like it, but we have to do it. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, yeah, I hear you. It's annoying because I think all of us, like, we'll start sitting down to write a paper. And the goal is to, like, change the world and reinvent the wheel yeah. with every paper you write. But sometimes right. it's prudential just to focus. Like, exactly. It's like good yeah, it's hard to, like, to focus. It's, yeah. it's very hard to focus. It's very hard That's to focus. That's something I'm still bad at. Especially way, now like, in the digital age right now with our phones right by our side. Like, okay, like, I'll write a like, few yeah. sentences, then I'll go on my phone on, like, TikTok. And then yeah. I'll come back to it, you know? It's good to have like small breaks and all uh, for sure to like rethink your mind, come back to it. But oh, sure. yeah, it's just yeah. very distracting, like putting it up to the last minute. That's really <laughs> bad. Yeah, it's, we, we, yeah, but most I, university students do that, unfortunately. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I mean, like a hundred percent, like I like to give myself breathing room with a paper. So mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to like finish a draft, give right. myself maybe a couple days off to be able to, like you kind of mentioned, like look at it with fresher eyes, right. sort of rethink yeah. it, see, like look at it from like an outside perspective and then maybe do like rewrites or revisions or whatever. But yeah, of course, right. you like in, your, in uni, you're going to cram and you're going to write things like last minute. Of course. And it's it's the product, part of the process, as they say. But now that <laughs> yeah. you've, uh, after completing uh, this degree, what does your career path look like right now after finishing yeah. this? Yeah. Um. So I sort of flagged earlier that like, a very popular career path for those who do a degree in philosophy is law school mm -hmm. um for just personal reasons and like passion based sort of right. reasons right. law school doesn't stick out to me very much it's not something i would say i never want to do but uh it's uh it's not exactly what i see myself doing mm -hmm. um the other kind of popular path um with philosophy is teaching Mm -hmm. um that's a longer path admittedly because you usually have to do like a graduate degree so right. most people either like master's phd or just their phd um and then you sort of ideally like you get a teaching job mm -hmm. um i have like i actually like just finished up applying to graduate school so i'm actually i'm waiting on results i'll hear back a little mm -hmm. later you know, fingers crossed or whatever um mm -hmm. my career path is more on the teaching side so hopefully gonna do some graduate school work for a little while um and then you know hopefully start hitting the academic job market in a sort of couple of years graduate programs are cool because they give you teaching experience while you're in school mm -hmm. so it doesn't sort of feel like i'm waiting forever to start right. working yeah. but the like sort of logical progression is like you do your undergrad if you want to teach you do a graduate degree and then you kind of hit the grad uh you hit the job market i see, uh, I see. And like my sort of backup, if I if I really if things don't work out and I sort of decide to sell my soul, is probably consulting. Um, mm -hmm. There's a you know just have to like sort of standard corporate consulting is actually a pretty popular job destination for philosophers too. Um, I think mm -hmm. that's just because like philosophy requires you to do a lot of problem solving, right. uh, especially if you kind of work on the stuff I work on, like ethics and like social choice theory. Like mm -hmm. generally businesses are becoming a little bit more interested in ethics and they're taking it more seriously. A lot of consulting firms sort of like that. But yeah, that's yeah. kind of what my career path ideally in, in like ideally looks like, I'm, you know, 
yeah. some more teaching side and I, I i'd like to just teach forever it's it's so much fun it, it's yeah like cool I, I totally agree with you i think teaching is really cool actually i applied to, to ece early childhood studies oh, before God. actually i went into media because i, I really love teaching kids young kids as well I think teaching is always going to be there no matter what. It's always that, that nice. safe route. And um, that's actually tied into my next question, actually. Yeah. Um, so um, is that why you want, you you became a teacher's assistant to, to see if that was yeah. really for you at U of T? Or did you, like, what drew you to become a teacher's assistant? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a, such an interesting question. Uh, it's kind of like a, um, it's, it's certainly a cycle, right? Because like, I think you get interested in something and then you try it out and either you get right. more interested in it mm -hmm. and then you want to do more of it. Right. So that mm -hmm. was kind of what teaching was like for me, where I was like, well, okay, I'm obviously interested in teaching because it sounds like a really cool career path. And generally the professors that I have seem like happy people. So if you can sort of work a job that makes you happy, it seems like a good thing. Um, right. So I, I sort of got interested and then I'm like, okay, without a doubt, I'm going to gun for this. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did it and I, I, I actually, I, I was a TA for quite a while. I was a TA during my undergrad and then after mm -hmm. until pretty recently. Um, and I loved it. Like I absolutely loved it. It's yeah. such an interesting kind of job to work. It's very rewarding in some ways. It also just like keeps you young because you're perpetually talking to younger people about mm -hmm. like big ideas. So in some ways it was really great. So anyway, the point is like, I really love teaching and then I just wanted to do it more. So it's that cycle of like interest, doing, growing interest, doing more. Right. Um, you sort of asked, you know, like what I guess the initial interest was. I think the initial interest for me was just having really good TAs um, mm -hmm. in my undergrad. Um, mm -hmm. I love like obviously working with professors is always cool. But at the end of the day, you're sort of working most hands on with your TAs, at, at least until sort of your senior year is and I had really supportive, sort of really excellent TAs that really shaped the way I learned and the way I went through my undergrad. And I think that's always just inspiring because you just end up wanting to do that. Like if someone impacts you in this like really positive way, a part of you is always going to be like, oh, I kind of want to pay that forward. Like I want to contribute uh, in that uh, in that way. So yeah, that was really the inspiration for me. And also like the sort of corporate administrative inspiration where i was just like this will look good on a resume like it'll be great to have some teaching experience when applying to graduate school and stuff right. so yeah there was that but at its core i think for me it was like oh having such great tas mm -hmm. um, was such a huge motivation to be like oh yeah this is a cool job like this is something i see myself doing and i want to do it yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i see i see um so yeah that, that's great to hear man um so now we're gonna segue into another question but we'll come back to, to the U okay. U yeah. philosophy thing but sure. i wanted to know um so did saint robert catholic high school really help you become you know you, did they give you the right tools to become successful for university uh what was your and what was your experience at the school like um i'll kind of answer your question in like reverse order um yeah. i'll start with my experience there and then sure. we'll talk a little bit about why not um, so I, I enjoyed uh, high school, which mm -hmm. I think is a, is a bit of a privilege. I, I know it's not like the most fun time for everyone. And I, I grant that. Um, mm -hmm. I think there were a couple of reasons it was really, I enjoyed it. Uh, for starters, I enjoyed it because I, I just happened to like make a lot of good friends during high school. And truly, like, mm -hmm. I think the difference between a great, good and bad time is going to be the sort of quality of the friends you have. And um at St. Rob's, I met people to this day who are like still some of my really close. Um, yeah, same, good... same here, same here. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's I, I think that's always something really. And I'm I'm happy to hear that on your end too. Yeah. That's, that's excellent. Um, yeah. I also enjoyed it too because, uh, St. Rob's is like a, like a pretty good school in the sense that like I generally felt like most of the teachers there really knew what they were doing. Right. Um, so I didn't feel like I was like wasting time in high right. school. I felt like, you know, I, you know, there's, there's criticisms to be made of like any educational institution, whatever, but like on the whole, I uh, really enjoyed it. And I'm going to start to transition into the next question. Sure, sure. There are two things that St. Rob's for me did particularly well. Um, Daniel, you probably can attest to this too. St. Rob's isn't like a super easy school. It's not about like it's not crazy, but like they're no. gonna teach you how to they're gonna teach right. you how to work. Yeah, yeah. they're gonna yeah. really teach you how to work. Um, St. Rob's is like academically rigorous. They take the programs yes. 
fairly seriously yes um and you're expected to do like at least moderately well in order to get past right for sure so yeah. one on on that hand they in, instilled in me like pretty good work ethic i think yeah for uh, sure yeah. and i think a lot of people who went there can probably agree mm -hmm. i know a lot of my friends they have their criticisms or whatever but work ethic is something we're all like okay yeah fair enough like, no yeah we, we for sure yeah um, and on a far more personal and less general level um i think st rob's is where i started to develop like a love for the humanities um mm -hmm. i had some excellent like not even just philosophy though i really did enjoy philosophy uh like i enjoyed history i enjoyed politics i of course enjoyed philosophy i enjoyed like the religion courses out there and i enjoyed like the art courses out there okay. um because of how good the you know teaching staff in those departments was and i think i just thoroughly enjoyed it and i i, I kind of knew going into university like oh i want to do more of this i don't know exactly what i want to do yeah. but i certainly want to like revisit some of these topics nice yeah now, that's, that's good uh, to hear yeah yeah, no, it's it's excellent. But the, the thing I want to say is, um, did St. Rob's equip me with the tools I need to succeed? No. Uh, mm. But I'm going to qualify that. It's right. a no, but that's okay. Because right. I think what people forget is that, like, you need a learning experience, too. Yeah, like, it is. A hundred percent, you should not have all the tools you need to excel um, in uni going in. You kind of should develop those as you're in university. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, no, like, uh, definitely not. Like, the, the, the learning style is different in uni. Uh, you're doing a lot more. You're expected to write, it, like, write uh, perform at a higher level. And generally, the content is just harder. Like, it is, like for example like what you'll learn in like an entire semester of like high school economics you're gonna cover in like week one of like economic 100 right. Economics 100 right? right so like you know, of course high school didn't like do this thorough preparation that's okay because i was able to kind of you know learn in uni as well and i, I think at its core like that's what you're, you should be doing like you should be picking up skills on the fly like i'm a big believer that like it's okay like not to know going in it's like a hundred percent okay to sort of learn as you grow yeah i think i think i have i have many things to add to add on to that um Please. yeah for seen always... robs like you said it was really academic rig like really rigorous academic wise yeah. um i yeah. feel as if like we were one of the top schools in ontario just because of how academically rigorous it was but on the other side radish you can attest to this as well we had no like social environment where we had like clubs or parties or you know gala nights yeah. some of high schools did have that but in general radish you can you can add to this as well sure. if you yeah. ontario high schools in general they don't equip you really well for university because like you said university is a learning experience but on itself and because they don't give you that uh, kind of like free uh, space to go yeah. and try out new things. Like I really wanted, like I invested my time in media, right? So I wanted to try and get media courses for myself, but I couldn't because St. Roberts didn't offer that. Another high school right. did. So if you don't go to that high school, well, it sucks yeah. to be you. You can't really get that for yourself. You have to go into that high school or you don't get anything. So that's why I want to see Rob's because it was it's a STEM based school. So it's a science, tech, mathematics school. You were into humanities. I was into media. So our departments kind of collided with each other, more or less. But we didn't have that platform where, OK, you can take more philosophy or humanities courses in grade 12. We had to take biology or physics or chemistry, the, the courses we didn't like to take. Not that we didn't want to. It's just we were interested in other things. Yeah. Right. So. I think in, in, in high school in general, they don't um, give you the option to go and pursue what you really like. I think they just bombard you with a bunch of general courses and like, yeah, good yeah. luck. And then in university, you figure out what you want to do. Yeah. But yeah, like, what do you what do you think about that? No, I mean, like, I, I agree, right? Like the Ontario curriculum is pretty fixed. Like, I, I, I think you have to take certain things. Um, right. From what I remember, like I think every year or like three or four years, like you have to take science. Yep. Um, yep. Two or three or four years, you have to take math. All four years, you take English. Yeah. Uh, and so on and so forth, right? Like you take one or two history courses, whatever. Yep. Um, I can kind of like I'm frustrated with it too because obviously it's you know um, it's not conducive to people who are not mm -hmm. like fundamentally interested in STEM. Right. Um, on the other hand. I kind of understand the purpose of like a general education. 
because it is I, I suppose in some sense you can't really figure out what you like until you like figure out what you don't like exactly uh, there's like a sense in which i can kind of see also like under resource constraints mm -hmm. i suppose like if you can't teach everything you want to teach a little bit of every, like you want to teach a little bit yeah. of everything yeah right uh, but I, I still think there's a happier medium like i think there are ways to aco accommodate people who are more inclined one way like having like a humanities stream opposite your stem stream seems pretty reasonable right but again like it's there's resource resource constraints there's time constraints mm -hmm. um i think in some sense that's why uni and like college is like a cool new experience right you go from doing a little bit of everything to being like well in uni you just do one thing every day right like you, you yeah your, it becomes your very specialized i think yeah on the other side of the spectrum you have to look like okay like high school okay everything's just general i get it but I wish it was like general in the first two years, like grade nine, 10, nice. and then grade 11 and 12, it gets more specialized just because you're getting into university, which is like very specialized. Yeah. Like you say, every single day, you're going yeah. to philosophy classes every single day. Okay, more or less one or two courses is going to be out of sight your stream because they're electives, but you won't see yeah. them anymore. The majority of it is just philosophy. The majority of it is just media. It says <laughs> one focal thing, yeah. the one thing you're focusing on. So, I mean, it is what it is. No, it is, it is, and I, I think, like, um, in some sense, I'm sure, like, grass always feel greener, like, I'm right. sure, like, in uni, especially if you're not, like, super crazy about what you're doing, you're probably like, oh, I wish I could take more of other stuff, yeah. in high school, you're probably just thinking, oh, I wish I could only take what I like, but it's, mm -hmm. it's sort of one of those things, right, like you said, it is what it is, I understand the general progression from general to specific, that seems like a good order to do things in, mm -hmm. um, I, I do just wish there was, like, a little bit of a happier medium. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, like coming back to, to U of T, uh, for the yeah, philosophy sure. program, um, what kind of like actually favorite courses you, you did like <laughs> you take at, at U of T? We've been talking about yeah. courses. What have been your favorite courses? <laughs> nice. That's such a great, that's such a great yeah. question. Um, um, okay. Let me, th so I think one of the courses, again, I enjoyed on a very personal level was, uh, like philosophy of religion. Mm -hmm. Um, it was really interesting, I think, partially because how um, because of why I started in philosophy in the first place. I had interest in those questions and sort of being able to do it was like excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, it was taught really well. It was taught by one of U of T's. In, in my opinion, she's one of the best profs at U of T, uh, Professor Eliza Freshy. She's just like brilliant teaching style, so insightful. Um, so I really enjoy that um, for like sort of personal reasons. Mm. On like the more like research side of what I was doing, I like really, really enjoyed some of the senior ethics courses I took. Mm -hmm. um, I had a professor, again, also really great, um, Professor Brendan DeCanessi. You can, I mean, the reason I'm naming these people is if anyone's interested, you can sort of Google them and see what sure, they're Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. like, um, first of all, again, Professor DeCanessi is just, he's a really cool guy, but he's also like, he has an interesting teaching style. It's very much discussing. It's very much debating. It's very much having these little like, thought experiment type situations so just learning in his style was really cool also just on a like topic was interesting too um it was the ethics of consequentialism consequentialism mm -hmm. is like a pretty dominant moral theory mm -hmm. it effectively just states that like okay for any decision that you should do so hard moral should for mm -hmm. whatever you should do you should do what is going to bring about like the best consequences mm -hmm. or like the best here kind of means like that's going to maximize the good intuitive like very intuitive moral theory and i think generally that's how people think like that's like whether or not you're a philosopher i think most of us just think like oh i should probably do what's going to result you know in the best in the best case um mm -hmm. but the reason the course was interesting because we were doing like the stress testing i was talking about earlier we were like trying to figure right. out you know where this doesn't go go well or where it goes wrong or where it sort of like fails to systematize things that make like obvious sense to us so it was really interesting because it's such an intuitive way of thinking um and sort of putting pressure on our intuition is always like a cool you know learning process in philosophy so yeah though that probably philosophy of religion and sort of like the senior ethics courses i took i see that's that's Those great that's great to hear yeah um so i know we're short on time so i don't think i'll get all oh, okay. into all my questions but i'll get to like at least at least the last two um sure so when you got into the program did you have any doubts in the first year because i know a lot of university students come into first year thinking like oh yeah that's this is the right program for me did you feel like it yeah. was the right program for you 
Yeah, I feel like all I had were doubts, uh, to no. be honest. Like, wow. first of all, uh, it's it's a re if you like look at my transcripts, like my actual transcript, philosophy one hundred in first year is like the course I just did the worst on. Mm -hmm. uh, like, truly, it's my like the one of the course I did so poorly on. And right. I genuinely because the one I think so like me being me, I was just like, haha, this is gonna be super easy. It's philosophy, and then I'm just getting like absolutely like my ass kicked every day because it's really hard stuff when you start out um so i was just i just didn't manage to do it very well um and i really had a lot of doubts i didn't think it was i certainly didn't think it was something i could do like for a living um i it was really not something i excelled at uh, or was very good at but i had a great ta um and uh, I'll, I'll name him as well um a great ta mike blezzy uh who really just encouraged me and gave me some really practical tips on how to like improve and I, I kind of just put my head down and I did it because I think the passion I had for philosophy at that point still was greater than like the pain I, I had doing it right like right. The, the, the enjoyment I generally gathered from philosophy kind of outweighed like getting like poor grades on it so mm -hmm. I, I stuck with it I, I got real real serious about it and in a sort of very poetic full circle moment the first course I ever TA'd was that one. It was mm -hmm. the course I did the worst on. So <laughs> right. I, I, I would tell my students that because for me, that was such a, like a full circle coming of age moment. So yeah, right. no, I absolutely had doubts. Mm -hmm. um, that's maybe all I had in, in philosophy. <laughs> I see. Well, I think it goes for everyone. I had doubts. Everyone, I think, has yeah. doubts coming into yeah. it. I think down the road, you kind of figure it out. You're like, okay, let me yeah. just stick into this program for another year and try it yeah. out before you make like snap final decisions, you know? Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, Radish, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. My last question. Um, okay, of course. Uh, any career advice you want to give any future cool. students who are interested in pursuing a philosophy degree? Okay, uh, that's, a, that's a great question as well. Um, so I'll give some like philosophy specific advice and then some more general advice. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I know we're kind of tight on time. Sure. Uh, my philosophy specific advice is just like, it's going to sound very silly and reductive, but truly when I say it, like read just everything um, as a, as a uni, as like a recent uni student and just a person, I know it's very easy to like skim the readings or mm -hmm. just like spark notes them right. or whatever. Um, that's fine. If you want like a, like a B minus on your philosophy, like you'll sure. do okay. All right. That's okay. But if you're serious about it and you want to understand, you have to first read the classics, like, there's a reason they make you read Plato, Aristotle, Locke, Hume, and Kant so much. It's mm -hmm. because until you understand those positions and mm -hmm. that tradition and the history and the canon, you're not going to understand your place in it at all. Right. Like until you right. figure out what other people have said and are bouncing off points, you're not going to find your voice. Um, reading is also important on the contemporary side mm -hmm. because you just need to know what other people are saying like yeah. on one hand like you cannot do interesting original research if you don't know what other people have already said uh if you're not familiar with what new like modern professional philosophers are saying you're not going to be able to put forward anything innovative or meaningful um, mm -hmm. it's also just generally a good practice because you learn to emulate professionals like right. if you read like really good philosophy you're going to intuitively start writing like that exactly um, in my opinion, like the best, best way to do that is just to like find the journals, like the academic journals in topics you like, and just read the newest articles, like spend a couple, spend like an hour or two on the weekend, just, you know, what, what recently came out in like philosophy and public affairs or what came out in the newest issue of mind or whatever, right? Like sure. you find the journals you like, right. um, as more general career advice, um, it is going to sound kind of funny, but generally like avoid both sides of narcissism and i'll explain what i mean by that like explain like as a student m both sides of narcissism are going to be like either you think that you're too good for anyone to help you and that's like a rough mindset especially in philosophy um or you're gonna think like you don't deserve to get help and resources mm -hmm. that's an equally negative like kind of narcissism right be confident enough to one ask for help but also be confident enough to think you like deserve help and like that, that yeah. you know that resources are something that you should be allowed to take advantage of too sure, yeah. um this can be anything from like go to office hours um, and talk to your professors uh if you like 
in we're in class with someone be confident enough to be like yo what you were saying was so interesting let's like grab coffee let's go study together yeah. i'd love yeah. to talk to you more or at, at the more like i guess formal level like if a professor really interests you you like shoot him an email be like yeah. hey i'm like so interested in your work um would you be willing to like supervise some research for me or if not can we just like can i talk to you about your work i think people who do that versus people who don't do that um there's like a massive difference in how far they get right uh, i think if you're like sort of confident but not nar too narcissistic to say okay I, yeah. I definitely need help and mentorship mm -hmm. but on mm -hmm. the other side i'm also worthy of being mentored and using resources uh, you will, you will, I, I think go quite far and I'm certainly further than people who don't. Um, yeah. so that's sort of my general career advice. No, um, that's, that, that's great like advice. Everything. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's, that's, that's great advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I think, yeah. uh, people are very hesitant, especially students to like, reach out and yeah. I think they have to break that barrier and reach no, out. That, I mean, like, I, I joke about it with some of my like friends and even my students, it's like, Dude, I was super annoying in undergrad. Like, I'm like at your door for office hours. I'm sending you emails. But like, until you get out of your head with that and you start to be a little annoying, like the whole, the world of resources was closed off to you. So you just kind of had to get over that. Yeah. 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 But Radish, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, yeah Radish. You can follow him on his social handles. Um on his LinkedIn. You, you have Instagram. Yeah, sure. Of course. LinkedIn, LinkedIn sounds okay. good if anyone wants to chat. Um Feel free. Daniel, thank you so much for having me. It was no a pleasure and like a privilege to be able to talk about this. No it, was, it was just nice talking to you and seeing you, man. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Here as well. Here as well. So thank you everyone for watching and remember to please uh, like and subscribe as always.